the first and second chapter of the Gospel of St. Luke. And there's this beautiful symmetry that happens uh, from the writing of St. Luke. We see two annunciations at the beginning of the chapter. We see this visit in the middle, and we see two births at the end of the chapter. And so <clears throat> and we start off in verse 39 in the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 1. Verse 39, it says, Now Mary arose in those days and went to the hill country with haste to the city of Judah. <clears throat> so we continue the text from the few Sundays now. And we, after the visit of Archangel Gabriel to St. Mary, we see St. Mary's response. <clears throat> she, arise, she, she arose in those days and went to the hills. She immediately went. And the word translated in the Greek is a word which refers to... <clears throat> the resurrection, this, this rising. So she goes with great haste, and she goes to see St. Elizabeth. As soon as Archangel Gabriel departed from St. Mary, St. Mary departs to the hills to see her cousin, St. Elizabeth. And there was news to share. St. Elizabeth and St. Mary both had amazing stories to tell one another. When God gives good news, it's news that must be shared. I think it's important for us to ask, who do I know that is in need of God's good news today? And St. Mary turned her heart to her cousin, St. Elizabeth, when she received the news. So the most natural thing in the world is that our hearts should be turned to those who are in great need of the good news. So, when we receive good news, when you and I receive good news, <clears throat> the very first thing that we want to do is share that news with, with someone, people that we know, people that we love. When a new child is born to a family, there's all these announcements, beautiful cards and things like that. The news of a long sought after job or the career path is set in motion. We share these with this news. We share with our friends and our family. It's been 2,000 years since the greatest news in history came to earth. Amazingly, there has not been greater good news than the news of God's intervention into this world through his incarnation, and it remains the greatest news of all time. It's news that needs to be shared. But I want to take a step back for a second. Sometimes <clears throat> we forget that the saints don't arrive to us from heaven fully formed. Before Moses parted the sea, he was a little baby in a basket. Before David <clears throat> slew Goliath, he was this unknown little shepherd boy. <clears throat> Before St. Mary became the mother of God, she was a humble young Jewish girl with godly parents and cousins, friends, just like any other young girl. And she needed good role models <clears throat> to encourage her to her positive spiritual growth. Her most obvious role models were her parents. They set a good example for, her, for their daughter. <clears throat> they raised her up with the fear of the Lord. And St. Mary was able to look at her, her older cousin, St. Elizabeth, and scripture tells us that St. Elizabeth was righteous before God. We were talking about this a few weeks ago. She was righteous before God, walking in all the commandments and ordinances of, of the Lord, blameless. What a great role model. So her living relatives were not her only role models for St. Mary. St. Mary also looked up to the godly women that she discovered in scripture. As a young Jewish girl, she would be familiar with the stories of the Old Testament heroes. Miriam, and Deborah, and Ruth, and Hannah, and Judith, and Esther. <clears throat> These holy women provided guidance by setting godly examples for a young woman to follow. <clears throat> it's an interesting comparison when you look at the, the connection between Hannah of the Old Testament, Samuel's mom, and St. Mary. They are both godly women who conceived children in a miraculous way. And after years of barrenness, Hannah, she fervently prays to God to give her a child. God hears her prayer, and he granted her to become the mother of 
Samuel, Samuel the prophet, one of the greatest prophets in the history of Israel. So as a virgin, St. Mary was approached by an archangel who told her that she would bear a child. And she willingly accepts these words and invites this miracle into her life. God rewarded her lowliness and granted her to become the mother of the Lord, God incarnate. So let's do this comparison. Hannah's response was a lovely prayer. St. Mary's response was also lovely. This is what we read today in the Gospel of St. Luke from, the chap- from verses 39 to 56. Let's compare Hannah's prayer and see how St. Mary's prayer resembles Hannah's prayer. Hannah's heart is strong in the Lord, as it's written in 1 Samuel chapter 2. St. Mary's soul magnifies the Lord. Hannah rejoices in her salvation. St. Mary rejoices in her Savior. Hannah praises the holiness of God. St. Mary praises the holiness of God's name. Hannah shuns pride and arrogance. St. Mary says God regards her lowliness. Hannah praises God for feeding the hungry, for emptying those who are fully uh, formerly full. And St. Mary praises God for feeding the hungry and for causing hunger among the rich. Hannah praises God for exalting the poor beggars, causing them to inherit the thrones of princes. And St. Mary praises God for exalting the lowly and for casting the mighty off their thrones. Hannah says the most important thing is to know the Lord. St. Mary says that the Lord's mercy is reserved for those who fear him. Hannah prophesied the coming of Christ, the anointed, the Lord's anointed. And St. Mary's entire prayer is response to the coming of Christ in her own womb. Just think, over a thousand years before Christ, Hannah had already prayed the prayer which would inspire St. Mary's prayer. This teaches us that the inspiration of the Holy Spirit is not always something of the past. Instead, God works continually, routinely, through our families, through our worship, through our role models. God did not wait for St. Mary until St. Mary prayed to inspire her prayer. No, God started much earlier when he inspired Hannah's prayer. He knew that a thousand thousand years later, a little Jewish girl named Mary, St. Mary, would learn about Hannah would look up to her as a godly role model, and then in the right time, Hannah's words would grace St. Mary's lips. This is how the inspiration of the Holy Spirit works. It's organic. It's long-term in this familial way. And it's encouraging when we're giving opportunities to pray with our kids and teach them the scripture and worship with them in the liturgy. If God is able to reach through a millennium using Hannah's example to inspire the heart of St. Mary, then he is able to do the same with us and our kids. The spiritual seeds that we plant are watered by our prayers, and the Holy Spirit will cause them to sprout at the right time. So going back to the first point today, This is news that needs to be shared. In other words, we need to be mindful of the spiritual seeds that we plant. Our mission, we were talking to Sayyidina recently, and the mission of the church is to focus on the pastoral care. This is the, the task to the fathers of the church. And as fathers of the church, we try to implant that into our servants so that the next generation can understand that it's important for us to visit. This is how we live the message. So the question that I have, we have a few questions. Do we visit our families as St. Mary did? And I say this in the context, especially around the holidays, and sometimes there's a little bit of tension here and there. Do we visit our families as St. Mary did? Do we avoid going to our families? Or do we go in haste? Do we bring the word of God? Or do we talk about silly things? 
Do we go out of love and care or do we go out of obligation and duty? Do we bring joy or do we have these feuds and we fight over silly things? If we really take a step back, are we fighting over silly things? Are the words that we talk about in our family gatherings, are they biblical? Are they helpful? Or are we wasting time? Do we focus way too much on the food? Do we visit others in the church to carry this message of love? As servants of God, do we visit those who are in great need? Our Lord says in Matthew chapter 25, I was in prison and you did not visit me. The prison of our sins, the prison of our suffering, the prison, the prison of, of pain. As we contemplate these gatherings this week, today even on Christmas, is our visit a blessing to others is a question that I would love for us to contemplate inwardly. As, our, as, as Saint Mary probably, or, or uh, Saint Elizabeth would reflect, it's a visit that she would never forget. This visit from Saint Mary to Saint Elizabeth, she would never forget it. Sometimes, unfortunately, we serve ourselves and we serve our own interests. I'm speaking for myself. You guys are much better than I am. We glorify our materialistic work. Even during worship, we, we focus on our fasting and my own praying. And we focus too much on self. At least I do. I know I do. But true service is the one that denies oneself and works silently and works mysteriously. St. Mary didn't have to wait to serve until she was asked. But she took the first initiative before she was even asked. This is how she served St. Elizabeth. And she served at the wedding of Cana of Galilee and these kind of examples. <clears throat> this is how she did before and is doing today and will forever do. St. Mary, when she accepted for herself Christ in her womb, and became the mother of the Son of Man, she became the mother of all humanity. And since that moment, she practiced her intercession work like a mother with overwhelming love in truth of her reliability and her responsibility as a mother of the Savior of the world. In the very same way, God first loved us, and he has begun this initiative of love, and he came down to us, because we're unable to go to him. He bends down to carry us from the dust and to rescue us from the depths, and he lifts us up to the heavens. In this way, when he dwells in us, we run in haste to those who are weak, and we search for everyone who needs help. This is our service. God's sacrificial gift to mankind is the basis of the church's emphasis on this, this time of giving. Sure, there's charitable giving, but there's giving of your heart. There's giving of your time. But unfortunately, our Christmas message has been, you know, has been turned upside down in this world that we live in. And I think we too, Orthodox, can be tempted to teach our kids that Christmas is about receiving rather than giving or sharing. We can get really busy, and sometimes the any sense of mystery is lost. How we celebrate Christmas can become a challenge. Christmas and the Christmas season are kept by all kinds of people in America, not just the Christians. And I think it's been transformed into a holiday. America has made Christmas part of their secular winter holiday. And so, how can Christians be distinguished from those who keep Christmas as a civil holiday? I think it requires us to think about why we, why we need Christ. This is important because as we reflect on books like the Incarnation, this is St. This is Athanasius' focus. To talk about the Incarnation, you have to talk about why we even need him in the first place. 
So why is his birth of any importance to our daily lives? At Christmas time, we spend more on gifts and candy and cards and food than any people at any point of history in the world. We take time every day to look for the elves that are hiding throughout the house. Sometimes we spend hundreds or thousands of dollars decorating our homes to be festive. We exchange gifts with everyone around us, our coworkers, everyone. We have become pros at celebrating Christmas. But if we're honest about our celebrations, these are outward celebrations. And as Christians, there is a proper inward preparation that precedes a proper outward celebration. Without this proper inward preparation, we find that in fact, our lives are a little out of tune. We become addicted to celebrating everything, everything, not just Christmas. We celebrate everything. And in doing so, we've kind of actually, we've, we've diminished anything that's actually worth celebrating. We make these things worthless. It isn't to say that we shouldn't rejoice and celebrate. That's not what I'm saying. The question is not, the question is, how does our celebration make Christ the center? That's what I'm asking. How does our celebration show that Christ is above all else? We can rephrase this. We can ask, how am I preparing to honor the birth of our Lord Jesus Christ? The church loves us and has given us certain tools to help us prepare for this great feast. Have we taken advantage of these tools or do we avoid them? And say, no, that's only for Abuna. Have we chosen to fast? Have we decided to turn off technology and gadgets a little bit more, a little bit earlier than, than in the evening during this fasting season? Have we decided to spend more time reading the Gospels and hearing the words of the Son of God, whose birth that we are getting ready to celebrate? Have we decided to pray in silence and to contemplate the mystery of this love that God has for mankind? Have we decided to repent and to make a clean and pure home for our Lord Jesus Christ in our hearts? Have we chosen to obey the words of the Son of God who was born of a virgin? Have we chosen to do the things that this Son of God has commanded us to do? feed the poor, visit the sick, the prisoners, to clothe the naked, to offer hope to the, home, to the hopeless. If we, the Christians, are too distracted to give life to the teachings of the Son of God, how can we ever expect the rest of the world to follow such a God? If we, the Christians, are not ready to live by His words, why would we bother celebrating his birth? In fact, we have no right to celebrate the birth of the king unless we are willing to submit to this king. In our Lord's birth, new life is offered to the whole universe and to each one of us. Don't get me wrong. I love Christmas celebrations. I want that peppermint latte I want that dark chocolate. I want to eat at the feast. But what I need is Christ. I could want those things, but what I need is Christ. Is my hunger for Christmas as a holiday? Or is my hunger a hunger for the feast? Truly for the feast. I can decorate my tree with ornaments. I can decorate my house with and my yard with amazing lights, but have I decorated my soul? Is it bright and full of light, or does it appear to be abandoned? Have I, I have prepared for a great celebration with my family and friends, 
but have I prepared my heart for the greatest gift ever that come to mankind. I pray that we properly prepare it inwardly, that we may properly rejoice with the angels this Christmas, today and January 7th. To conclude, as St. Gregory, the theologian, puts it, let us become like Christ since Christ became like us. Let us give all, offer all, but one can give nothing like oneself, understanding the mystery and becoming for his sake all that he became for ours. We pray that we too can imitate St. Mary's example of readiness and generosity in the service of our brethren. We pray that we never lose the true meaning of this holy day. And on January 7th, God took what is ours and he gave us what is his. He visited us in our difficulty and he elevates us. God humbled himself and without ceasing to be God, he came and became the son of man. We praise and we glorify him who was born in Bethlehem and exceedingly exalt him. And glory be to God forever. Amen. We exalt you, Lord.